Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to today's talk by art historian John Walsh. Today's part one of a series of four talks in which Walsh will discuss the work and ideas of the Dutch painter Piet Mondrian. John Walsh is a renowned independent art historian. He was the director of the J. Paul Getty Museum from 1983 until 2000. After graduating from Yale and getting his PhD from Columbia, he worked as a curator at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and he taught art history at Columbia and Harvard. Since he left the Getty, he's been teaching at Yale on and off and giving public lectures there. He gave an eye-opening lecture series on Vincent van Gogh at Yale and here at the Hammer in 2019, and another series on Rembrandt here in 2020. And those um, talks are available on the Hammer website, and I highly, highly recommend them. They're completely fascinating. Walsh is the, many, the author of many articles and catalogs on Dutch painting in the 17th century, and, and of several books, including Jan Steen, The Drawing Lesson, and the J. Paul Getty Museum and its Collections, a museum for the new century. He currently serves on the boards of the Yale University Art Gallery and of the Hammer Museum. Each of Walsh's four talks on Mondrian will focus on the evolution of Mondrian's ideas and theories from figurative painting to abstraction as they developed throughout his life. Today's talk will focus on Mondrian's early years as a landscape painter. In two weeks, on September 8th, and please note we had to skip a week because next weekend is the opening of our fantastic new biennial, and you're all invited. I hope you'll come see it. Um, so in two weeks, on Sunday, October 8th, Walsh will talk about Mondrian's first explorations of cubism, which suggested new possibilities for representing the visual world. So I'd like to invite you all back for that talk, and that'll be followed by parts three and four on October 15th and October 19th, uh, 29th. In lieu of a Q&A today, we invite you all to join Dr. Walsh for coffee, tea, and cookies in the theater lobby where we can have further discussion about Pete Mondrian. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming the one and only John Walsh. Thank you, Claudia. Where are you? Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be at the Hammer always. It's one of the most exciting programs in town. Uh, it's also nice to be introduced by Claudia, who's the, the best at it. Um, I'm uh, going to um, speak in this series um, and take you through a career of an artist whose work, for most of you, is very easy to recognize. We're asked, how did that happen? Uh, what did Mondrian want to achieve with all of these austere abstract paintings? And how did they work? And what use could we make of them? We're going to trace his development uh, during his working life of 50 years. And I'll often quote Mondrian himself as he tries to explain what he was doing. Later in the series, we're going to look at some of Mondrian's own contemporaries, uh, abstract painters themselves with utopian inclinations, uh, artists whose work inspired him, and other painters and architects and designers that he inspired. Mondrian was extremely slow to mature. I mean, here he was already 36 when he painted himself uh, with, with uh, behind him one of his uh, first uh, geometrical abstract exercises hanging on the wall. Next to it is the breakthrough of just two years later uh, with his unmistakable colors and structure. He's already halfway through his life, already with a career behind him. I'm going to take a few minutes now to turn the clock back uh, 20 years and recapitulate Mondrian's beginnings uh, as an artist. Mondrian was born in 1872, and he grew up in Winterswijk, which is that small Dutch town near the German border with the circle around it, uh, in the so-called back corner of Gelderland, 100 miles east of Amsterdam, and a world apart. His father was a strict Calvinist schoolmaster whose hobby was drawing, 
And when he saw that his son had talent and wanted to become an artist, he went along with that, but a bit grudgingly at times. Um, here's Mondrian writing at the age of 70 and looking back. He said, I began to paint at an early age. My first teachers were my father, an amateur, and my uncle, a professional painter. I preferred to paint landscape and houses seen in gray, dark weather, um, or in very strong sunlight when the density of atmosphere uh, obscures the details and accentuates the large outlines of objects. I often sketched by moonlight, cows resting or standing immobile on the flat Dutch meadows, or houses with dead blank windows. I never painted these things romantically, but from the very beginning, I was always a realist. Well, his uncle Fritz was a competent realist painter and could give Pete the free lessons that he could afford uh, during the summer in the countryside around Wintersweg. What doesn't, doesn't uh, come out in uh, Mondrian's account is his academic training. Uh, he was promising enough at the age of 10, uh, 19 to get into the Royal Academy in Amsterdam. For three years, he worked at drawing plaster casts, life models, and still life. But he had to paint, paint landscape on his own, since that was still thought a lesser genre and discouraged by the Academy. He was ambitious and sociable, and by 22, he belonged to the leading artists' society in Amsterdam, Arti et Amacitie, a private club that's still there, still going. Uh, hardly an avant-garde hangout, though, but a place where well-behaved artists could meet up and exhibit. In the 1880s, the commercial city of Amsterdam was booming and spreading out, but the art market was still conservative. In Amsterdam and in The Hague, there was a steady demand by Dutch and foreign buyers for familiar-looking pictures of farms and cottages and canals and bridges, cattle, windmills, and sturdy peasants in quaint towns, all painted in tranquil weather with subdued colors. Supply followed demand, and change came very slowly in the Netherlands. Uh, the French Impressionists had been shown in the Netherlands in the early 19, 1890s, and they had some Dutch followers, uh, called Luminists uh, by Dutch critics, but their work had a dubious reputation with many art writers and collectors because they seemed to lack discipline. Their intentionally unfinished look was a fault, not a virtue in the Netherlands. In Amsterdam, uh, Mondrian encountered the work of conservative innovators like George Henry Breitner, uh, whose wonderful brushwork he must have admired. The big jolt came from seeing paintings by Vincent van Gogh, who had left Holland for Paris in 1886 and after two years died in France in 1890, and whose work the Dutch public first saw in Amsterdam in two exhibitions in 1882. Those created a lot of excitement and critical debate. For Mondrian, Van Gogh was an example of a completely committed Dutch artist who had taken the examples that Paris had to offer and then gone off on his own. His landscapes not only responded to his emotions, but they also embodied his visions of the energies of the natural world. So for Mondrian, he was a model of courage and belief, if not of his painting style. That was going to take time and many experiments to develop. <clears throat> well, you may sense Van Gogh behind the haystacks that Mondrian painted in the year of those exhibitions. The thick oil paint of this little sketch has real force. I mean, Mondrian already knows what he's doing. And the steep perspective in this view of Amsterdam on the right, this canal <clears throat> with a snaky channel, uh, has some real genu genuine uh, originality. 
I suspect he's remembering the wonderful, nearly impressionist snowy scene that Breitner had shown uh, a year before. Mondrian had money problems all his life, off and on, but especially for more than five years after he finished at the academy. He had to give private drawing lessons, he had to teach, make copies of old masters, scrounge for any kind of work involving paint or design, anything. But when he could, he walked or biked around the countryside making drawings and oil sketches of the suburbs and the land around the city. <clears throat> this is where his skills as a composer and a painter developed steadily in a series of experiments with technique. You remember his words, I always was a realist. A critic at the time who saw some of these little pictures wrote this, there is a feeling for rhythm which quickens to the pulse of life and seems somehow to be connected with his positive sense for the new. And with the other, a love of order and balance which is at the root of his search for unity and fullness. Those words, rhythm, order, balance, a search for unity, fullness, this is all very close to what Mondrian declared years later that he had been searching for in his work. He was certainly aware of other ways to conceive landscapes uh, that painters were practicing during these years in Holland and Belgium, the so-called symbolists, uh, contemporaries <clears throat> of the Belgian poet Metterlink, whose tastes ran to mystery, to muted light and spooky trees, uh, whether the scenes were completely imaginary, like the canal at the top, or were actual places at the bottom, which is a castle outside Leiden, framed with witchy trees. If there was an avant-garde in Amsterdam during Mondrian's early years as an artist, it was these symbolists. In 1891, a leading Dutch critic wrote an essay entitled The Death of Naturalism, calling for artists to turn away from painting nature and its varieties of experience, and instead to turn inward to the spirit, the soul, the imagination. For a while, um, Mondrian adopted a symbolist mood in the austere colors uh, and the fastidious, hyper-real composition of this view on the left of a village church. <clears throat> he had some success with this, and also with watercolors, uh, like the one at the upper right, which is a very delicate view of the flat farmland and also with small, robust oil sketches, like the two in the middle. To make ends meet and to stay visible in exhibitions, <clears throat> Mondrian also painted portraits and still lifes in watercolor. Both those categories were bestsellers at the turn of the century, <clears throat> which bored him, but he did conscientiously and did very well. Mondrian roved around the countryside to the southeast of Amsterdam, uh, which had been a favorite locale for the previous generation of uh, successful landscape painters like Paul Gabriel. That's, you can see on the right, Mondrian on his bike, which he had equipped so it wouldn't tip over while he stopped and sketched. This picture of a windmill by Gabriel done a dozen years earlier had become a kind of sentimental favorite in Holland, and it still is. It still attracts clumps of visitors at the Rijksmuseum. Mondrian painted a lot of views along the river Geen, and they have a different flavor from Gabriel's. No spectacular, puffy summer clouds. They're more apt to be moonlit with unspectacular skies above a meticulously painted marshy foreground or a little bit later on, <clears throat> and still with a lot of foreground, but with a silvery reflections and a kind of grayed out atmosphere. Mondrian painted this particular windmill about 20 times. So I thought I'd better have a look for myself. Um, it's uh, much the same, uh, except for that 
path uh, on the dike. Um, it's been paved, um, and the mill uh, is out of service, uh, but you can rent it by the week. Um, it has three bedrooms, we discovered. <coughs> uh, that's my fender at the lower left. Uh, and don't worry, uh, my daughter Anne is behind the wheel. He painted larger pictures for exhibition using a technique that comes as a surprise, first making a drawing in charcoal on sheets of paper almost as big as the canvas he'd be using in the studio. This one is almost five feet wide. He drew with a hard black chalk and soft charcoal, and then used the drawing as a basis for three big atmospheric landscapes that he painted in the studio. Um, Here's uh, another river. Um, <clears throat> he finds um, a motif he likes and makes a drawing to record the details. Um, here, farm buildings screened by trees, uh, trees that arch over them, uh, to make a canopy that's reflected in the water to form one long oval with a scribbly boundary. That creates a vignette effect that accentuates the artifice of the view, which is a device that the Cubists will be using in Paris in a few years, few years time, Mondrian included. <clears throat> then, back in the studio, he recreates the farm, accentuates the symmetry, obliterates the detail with very broad strokes of pewter gray and silver. In this four-foot-wide picture, the atmosphere really makes the painting. The moonlight almost obliterates the farm, and it creates a new motif, that sin sinuous uh, silver shape of the river. Uh, here the moon has a, an aureole, a kind of rings of light in the haze that adds to the mystery. You know the moon plays a familiar role in paintings painters' imaginations in the 19th century. It had in Holland, uh, um, as you see on the upper left, uh, centuries earlier, and it would again in the Romantic era. In, in the center, the American uh, <clears throat> Ralph Blakelock, and at the right, Mondrian's Norwegian contemporary, Edvard Munch. The moon is remote, changeable, familiar, but somehow unknowable. For Mondrian, sunsets could also suggest mystery. A flat pasture where for a few minutes an ordinary cloud is turned into an extraordinary fiery apparition. Mondrian paints it with daubs and squiggles. And because we're accustomed to painterly abstraction in our own time, it seems amazingly modern. The sun has other associations in the 19th century that Mondrian and his generation inherited. Uh, here's an example that he painted a year later in Zeeland, just a foot and a half wide. Uh, I'm going to slow down now <clears throat> for a minute and look at it with you with some details, and I'll be quiet while you look. We're looking at the sea and the tidal shallows in the bottom half. And above the horizon, there's a great cloud bank silhouetted against the golden light from the sun that's already set. <clears throat> Closer in, you can see how he did it, with long strokes of blue paint dragged over the red layer underneath. And you can see the reflected yellow sky dabbed on 
in the tide pools. That massive pileup of clouds in the exact center, together with the light, suggests that this is not just an ordinary sunset, but a sign of some higher presence. That was certainly what Mondrian intended. You've seen that paintings of the moon rising or setting were familiar to Mondrian and art lovers at the time. So were scenes of the sea with the sun going up or coming down. There had been a century of paintings and prints composed like these. The best known by Caspar David Friedrich, the two on the right, most often with witnesses who seem to be contemplating the boundary of the world they know and the mysteries of the unknown. Mondrian was fully conscious of carrying forward a tradition. He was 26 when he drew himself with the face of a mystic, a seer. He had come to the summer, <clears throat> in the summer to the beaches of Zeeland. Um, they are broad and shallow and have views west across the English Channel toward England, which is out of sight, 100 miles or so in the distance. He wasn't alone. And Domburg, uh, on the Isle of Walcheren, had a summer community that drew artists and writers and was a kind of lab for Dutch painters, several of whom had come back from Paris with full of new ideas. The most charismatic of this group was this man, Jan Torup. Uh, Torup, who was a little older than Mondrian and whose subjects and style of painting made a great impression on him. They helped Mondrian launch a whole series of remarkable experiments with the pointillist technique that Torup had learned in Paris from the so-called neo-impressionists. Mondrian's brush strokes were broader uh, and more impulsive than his contemporaries uh, who were working in this mode. We're going to come back in a few minutes to Mondrian's conversion in Paris to Cubism, and just three years later, and the ways in which he made his works grow out of the geometries that he saw and he felt in nature. At this point, in 1909, Mondrian had made several discoveries. Uh, writing 35 years later, he recalled one of those about color. Remember, he said he was always a realist. After several years, he said, my work unconsciously began to deviate more and more from the natural aspects of reality. Experience was my only teacher. I knew little of the modern movement when I first saw the work of the Impressionists, Van Gogh, Van Dongen, the Fauve, I admired it, but I had to seek the true way alone. The first thing to change in my painting was the color. I forsook natural color for pure color. I'd come to feel that the colors of nature cannot be reproduced on canvas. Instinctively, I felt that the painting had to find a new way to express the beauty of nature. Well, one new way for Mondrian was to intensify the color of nature and to imply, uh, apply them with long strokes drawn by the brush. Here he paints a forest with long bare tree trunks in moonlight using a pared down palette of blues and reds and yellows that suggests the pure primaries he'll use later. The long strokes, the emphatic hor horizontals and verticals give the composition a kind of severe geometry. Another color experiment around the same time <clears throat> is the familiar chorus of trees along a familiar river, again dancing in the moonlight and reflected in the water. Like the forest we just saw, it has an air of enchantment about it in the plain geometry and in the strange sort of rusty red color of the sky and reflections. Mondrian believed that he had a push at the conventions of color, not, not to shock people or from some itch for uh, novelty, 
but out of a general, genuine emotion and a desire to express an almost religious feeling in the landscape, somehow to find a way to depict it. You might think that Claude Monet's poplars might have suggested the motif here, the trees planted at regular intervals along a river bank and reflected in it, but there isn't any evidence that he saw Monet's poplar paintings at all at this point. Mondrian could use the poplars differently, in fact. The bend in the river here called for a sweeping composition of trees that we've seen before, undulating in the last rays of the sunset. Mondrian sets them off against mottled bright blue clouds, high above a lowering mass of heavy clouds at the left. Mondrian is after the essence of the scene. He's pushing for more and more intensity in color and design. This meant isolating the motif. Uh, here, an apple tree just past sunset against saturated blue puffs behind it. The tree and the gnarled branches are still touched with bright red. You get the sense that something is something that he's actually witnessed, an experience of light and color recreated as a kind of hallucination or visitation. I forsook natural color for pure color, you heard Mondrian say. He emphasized going his own way with color, and he played down the stimulus he got from these younger Dutch painters, a few of whom he exhibited with in Amsterdam in 1909. These people had worked in Paris and brought home brighter colors and sometimes louche subjects, like Van Dongen at the left, but also Jan Sluiters in the middle and the older Jan Torup, whom you met earlier. All of these had recently absorbed the startling new colors of Matisse and Durin and the so-called Fauve group, amped up reds, clashing complementary colors, green and red, orange and blue. In the 1909 exhibition in Amsterdam, I just mentioned, Mondrian showed this canvas, five feet high. He'd entered the game. One critic thought it was decadent and said he feared for Mondrian's mental health. A famous Dutch novelist, uh, Israel Querido, who admired Mondrian, saw the picture and wrote this, I have never seen such a murderous colors. The flames are cooking. The contours of the mill bleed in red and also scorching yellow. The blood streams, golden yellow, India yellow, cadmium yellow light with a radiant vermilion and orange. All these fall like a rainbow of colors from the scorched sky. Feel along with this flood, with this fulminant glow, with heat blazing into the distance, with these crackling flames of fire, the infernally gnawing embers of the day in the open space of the sun. A few Amsterdam artists and others, writers, <clears throat> contributed something else to Mondrian's thinking in these years, something spiritual and something that he took seriously. When Mondrian was in his 30s and experimenting with avant-garde ideas that reached him second-hand, he was introduced to theosophy by his friends in Amsterdam. Theosophy was what Mondrian called a spiritual science, a kind of mix of Stoicism, Buddhism, and Western philosophy and ethics, as well as modern science, including evolution. It had been founded 25 years earlier in London by a Russian mystic, Helena Blavatsky, and an American emigre seeker, uh, Henry Alcott. And they inscribed the photograph that you see in the middle uh, to their chapter in New York City. There's also a chapter in Amsterdam that Mondrian eventually joined. It had a following among artists and architects and intellectuals, among others, Rudolf Steiner, who eventually went his own way. There was also a chapter uh, near him in the mid-1930s when he lived 
uh, for a few years in Laren. Um, he gave a lecture, Mondrian did, uh, a lecture to this group on art and theosophy that reportedly met uh, with total incomprehension. <laughs> Nevertheless, theosophy did have a lasting effect on Mondrian's beliefs about what a new art might do to improve the world. It gave him the belief that everything in the world is inherently, inherently unstable, the product of opposing forces of all kinds, up and down, male and female, light and dark, and so on, and that art can embody those opposing forces and bring them into balance. A new abstract art would evolve from the obsolete figural art. It would have an equilibrium that is not fixed, but dynamic. An equilibrium of form and color that can even serve as a model for ethics in our individual lives and ultimately for a healthier society. And Mondrian invented imagery to convey states of evolution, to symbolize the cycle of life and death and regeneration. He painted sunflowers, prompted evidently by Van Gogh's, but instead drooping in death. Other flowers symbolize passing time, like the lily blossom at the left, fully open, and the other, <coughs> other collapsed. Or at the center, to show off brash vitality, like that stunning uh, am amaryllis flower, painted with the hottest crimson, set off against a blue like the sky in the red tree. There are a few figure pieces by Mondrian that are explicitly spiritual, and they've given critics and art historians quite a lot of trouble to justify ever since they were first exhibited. He wrote to one of his critics saying that the title he gave for the picture Devotion on the left didn't mean that she was devout, but that he, the artist, had conceived her devotedly, and that the unnatural red of her hair was his way of suppressing the material side of things as they appear in nature, and instead stressing the spiritual. The triptych on the right has um, been even harder for people to swallow. The three nudes in three steps towards enlightenment were evidently meant to symbolize the upward evolution of the human spirit. That was almost the last of Mondrian's figure painting, but not the end of his interest in theosophy. That interest had taken a serious turn in 1908 when he first visited Jan Torup in Zeeland, uh, who had formed that summer artistic circle that I mentioned that included some other theosophists. You've seen the fierce reds and yellows of this mill on the left. Here's, on the right is the windmill in Domber, same size, five feet high, its cylindrical form radically flattened, seemingly punctured by a little window reflecting blue. The mill is cropped so that the tower is disturbingly close to us, and the perspective of that cylindrical base is warped so that its curve is actually reversed Mondrian has taken the windmill that's always been a proud emblem of Dutch ingenuity, <laughs> machines that pumped out the water and reclaimed the land from the sea, and that ground grain to sustain life. He's removed the windmill from the customary surroundings and used it to capture the intense last rays of the sun and intensify them. It is a weird and intimidating image. And up close, you can see it's anything but mechanical. His hand is busy. Even in the monochrome areas on the right, you can see he's hatching and adding swipes of shading at the edges. Two more massive upright frontal forms, not proclaiming faith for Mondrian so much, but artistic liberty. 
and their exercises in technique as well. This is pointillism for completely different purposes. On the left, to stress the solid mass and the weight of the tower, and on the other, to use floating planes of color to de dematerialize the church and fracture the sky. You wonder, looking at that sky, maybe he's already seen Cubist paintings. That's possible. He was certainly not settled on a style. Uh, one of the great pictures from this period <clears throat> is a view of the dunes looking towards the sea, nearly seven feet wide, just three blues, plus golden yellow, getting close to the edge of abstraction here, putting across a sort of breathless wonder. In 1911, when he was 29, still a provincial finding his way, he'd hardly ever traveled outside Holland. By the end of the year, though, Cubism had come to him. He saw pictures by Braque and Picasso and some others in an exhibition in Amsterdam where the Cubists were prominent. It was a stunning event for him, and by the end of the year, he'd broken his brief engagement to Greta Hauerbrook. He packed up and taken the train to Paris. He wrote later on, it was during this early period of experiment that I first went to Paris. The time was around 1910, when Cubism was in its beginnings. I admired Matisse, Van Dongen, and the other Fauves, but I was immediately drawn to the Cubists, especially to Picasso and Leger. Of all the abstractionists, Kandinsky, the Futurists, I felt that only the Cubists had discovered the right path, and for them, for a time, I was much influenced by them. Gradually, I became aware that Cubism did not accept the logical uh, consequences of its own discoveries. It was not developing abstraction toward its ultimate goal, the expression of pure reality. So he acknowledges the Fauve painters, who had helped intensify his colors. And more important, he emph emphasizes Picasso and Leger, what he called the right path the Cubists had discovered was to see the basic geometries in the visual world and to render their elementary shapes, pyramids, cones, cubes, and so forth, and rearrange them. You could make out still what or who the picture represented, but you had to work at it, to be involved with the picture. The Cubists believed that they were representing a pure reality, but for Mondrian, it wasn't yet pure enough. We don't know just what French pictures Mondrian had seen before he moved to Paris. A cubism had originated with landscapes that Braque had been painting just a couple of years later, very much influenced by Cézanne, the most important of the post-impressionists. Cézanne had died in 1906, and a group of paintings by him were on view at, and on loan at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Cézanne had set an example for cubism in his search for elementary geometries in the world that lay behind and beyond the confusion of changing appearances. This painting by Mondrian on the left is a kind of homage to Cézanne, Picasso had moved away from the relatively realistic colors and Shakespeare and shapes of his breakthrough paintings of a few years earlier. He'd purged color and was working in browns and grays. He emphasized long lines and short stabbing parallel hatchings. Space has collapsed. Whether the subject <coughs> is a still life <coughs> or a guitar player, there's not much you can recognize right away. <clears throat> In this phase of cubism, the game for the viewer is one of decipherment, so-called synthetic cubism, and it opened many doors for many artists. 
Mondrian resettled in Paris in 1912 with ease. <clears throat> he had a studio, an apartment. He adjusted to life with the help from Dutch emigre friends, and he settled in. He met other artists and worked hard and enjoyed the nightlife. And since he was sociable, he visited studios and galleries, and he fit right in. By now, an entire circle of Cubists have been following the example of Picasso and Brock for the past few years. Uh, Delaunay and Leger are spinning off their own versions, but exchanging visits, going to shows, arguing in cafes. The list of foreign artists living there before World War I broke out in 1914 was impressive, including these, Juan Gris on the left, is a purist, one of the few to extend the life of synthetic cubism. Mondrian's friend Fernand Leger, Leger in the middle and at the right, uh, it was the quickest to learn. And instead of abandoning color, he does what Mondrian will do 10 years later, reducing the palette to primary colors, to blue and red and yellow. And he reintroduced volumes and spaces and reduced his humans to automata of cones and cylinders. One writer called Leger's style tubism. <laughs> there was Delaunay, who also became a friend of Mondrian's, and the Italian Gino Severini in the middle, both of them smitten by the miracles of the m m machine age. Severini was one of the first futurists, there was also, at the right, Malevich, born in Poland, who found a way to recreate the sensation of repetitive motion with overlapping images. And there was Marcel Duchamp, who used the same device um, in the notorious nude descending a staircase, which caused a scandal in Philadelphia and elsewhere. Mondrian saw most of this, but he had brought his own image, uh, images with him uh, from Holland, images he'd struggled with, and he took them up again to tackle the challenge of cubism. Color could be dispensed with. It was now for him structure that preoccupied him. The red tree was a big structure with a heavy lean and a turbulent sky in the background. The gray tree on the right stands straighter by comparison with fewer branches pruned to create a kind of open work pattern with curves that define compartments. Those are filled with gray brushstrokes, <coughs> energetic strokes viscous, and they have a kind of life of their own. The empty space behind the tree, the branches, uh, the space between them, which had read as voids in the red tree, they push forward and reduce the distinction between object and setting, between solid and void, figure and ground those fundamental distinctions of all Western art until they give way to the new cubist Mondrian. Mondrian draws trees in the parks of Paris. In the very large drawing on the left, the trees form a canopy in, on stilts under a kind of arch-like frame. There's still conventional perspective recession but in the center drawing, he makes a kind of layout drawing that tests the possibility uh, of the cross section uh, of a Gothic church. And at the right, one of the first paintings of his that uses the strictly limited color scheme of analytical cubism applied to a design like the one at the left with a tree and spreading canopy in the center. A year or so later, he's still drawing trees in the city, 
with bits of stairs and fences and even some buildings in the background, he's seeing a pattern of vertical, vertical tree and horizontal branches backed up by bits of that pattern behind. The painting at the right, uh, which entitled uh, by Mondrian in French, Tableau, abstracts the pattern in the drawing even further. The tree and branches are in the center. He adopts another cubist practice, which is pulling a, a gray wash over the around the edges over the pattern so that what remains sort of floats free and it thwarts any efforts we might make to see a scene here. It removes any illusion of three dimensions. Buildings also serve as subjects for Mondrian. At the very top, a conscientious drawing uh, by him of a church in Domber in Zeeland uh, that he used for paintings. You've seen the most extreme of these adaptations already, the picture at the left, and he evidently also used it for the large drawing uh, down uh, in uh, next to the right, a sort of f fantasy on the theme of church, expressing the facade by a few arches and a lot of horizontal and vertical lines suggesting architectural bits windows, doors, buttresses, and so forth. But Mondrian has set those things free. He recomposed them and surrounded the whole thing by a very cubist octagonal frame. Those patterns of short black lines, the mostly vertical and horizontal lines that create little colored rectangles, reappear in the painting on the right. And they're the dominant motif we might see it as suggesting stained glass. Uh, Mondrian would have politely discouraged that, since that kind of illusion was not what he was doing. He was working to avoid it. Mondrian would say that there is energy in that restless play of opposites, as we'll hear. Buildings that had been demolished had particular interest for Mondrian, because they had left their imprint behind on the exposed walls of the buildings next door. And there were a lot of those. Uh, in the middle is Mondrian's street in Montparnasse, which had been colonized by avant-garde artists from all over. Um, that brought a rash of makeovers, including Mondrian's building. There were plenty of ready-made cubist comp compositions left for a while on exposed walls. Uh, and just a warning, um, when you're in Paris, don't go looking for his building unless you're morbidly curious because it's been replaced. There's a McDonald's next door and the neighborhood is overwhelmed by that infamous skyscraper, the Tour Mont Montparnasse, which I can't bear to show you. Um, several big drawings of like this one gave Mondrian material for a group of curious cross-section paintings, uh, like the one at the right. Uh, the message may be, under the skin, our civilization is cubist. Anyway, um, Mondrian had brought paintings with him to Paris and sketches that were recollections of Zeeland. They were material for some new paintings that have an unbounded vastness about them a kind of repetitious structure in the ceaseless waves, a rhythm that he could see as elemental in nature. Here, at the right, it's all horizontal and gentle curves. Motion without mass or details, just a suggestion of recession into depth by his narrowing the intervals as you moved upwards. It soon Mondrian was going to find a way to suggest the sea even more abstractly with his favorite device, the incessant crisscrossing of lines. Thirty years later, Mondrian would write about his struggle towards abstraction in those years. He said, During this period of research in Paris, I made many abstract paintings of trees, houses, plants, other objects. They were exhibited at the Salon des Indépendants, Shortly before the outbreak of World War, 
and that's in 1914, I went back to Holland on a visit. And I remained there for the duration of the war, continuing my work of abstraction in a series of church facades, trees, houses, etc. But I felt that I still worked as an impressionist and was continuing to express particular feelings, not pure reality. Although I was completely conscious that we can never be absolutely objective, I felt that one can become less and less subjective until the subjective no longer predomin predominates in one's work. More and more, he wrote, I excluded from my painting all, all curved lines until finally my compositions consisted only of vertical and horizontal lines which formed crosses, each one separate and detached from the other. Observing sea and sky and stars, I sought to indicate their form-giving function through a mis multiplicity of crossing verticals and horizontals. And he added, impressed by the vastness of nature, I was trying to express its expansion and rest and unity. At the same time, its limitation, vertical and horizontal lines are the expression of two opposing forces. These exist everywhere and they dominate everything. Their reciprocal action constitutes life. This led to a breakthrough, which we're going to return to. In the meantime, Mondrian had to return to the Netherlands on family business. So he closed the studio in 1914 and returned home. War broke out while he was there and it was five years before he returned to Paris. He then stayed for 20 years becoming the artist we know and recognize. In the next lecture, we're going to explore just how he did that. You won't want to miss that. I hope you don't. Please, please come and join me. Thank you.